an honor to be uh, followers of the Prophet sallallahu So this is the second session of uh, our discussion of soul searching. Now, really the aim of this discussion is to kind of look inwardly to be able to move forward externally into the world with a positive footing. And one of the, you know, the essential, I, I guess, existential questions that human beings have always is asked is who am I and what is wanted of me? You know, and for you to be able to speak about who you are and be able to provide something towards others, be able to give a sense of clarity and a sense of being in your makeup towards others, it always begins with yourself, that inward look. What do I want and what do I seek? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala centers that focus very much upon us. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always asks us to become from those who look inward, to seek to make known to ourselves first who is important in our life and what it is uh, that we seek. And the most important person in your life is you. And that becomes a very, very important aqidah perspective, you know, a perspective of your faith and your creed that you must look after yourself. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Tahreem, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu qu anfusakum, save yourself wa ahlikum. And that will follow suit with you looking after your progeny, your family, and those who are important uh, that can come thereafter in, in your life and in that regard. But it becomes very, very important for you and I to become people who are very self-centered in that sense, that the one who doesn't have cannot give. And if I do not have faith, I cannot share faith. If I do not practice, I cannot preach. And it is something where Allah always says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu lima taquluna ma la taf'aloon. Why do you step forward with statements of that which you yourselves are not implementing or practicing? So that becomes a very important conceptualization that I must look within myself, look within my heart, look within my very essence and being, search my soul to discover what it is that I can put forward. Well, and let each of us look towards what it will bring uh, tomorrow, insha'Allah. So for those of you, alhamdulillah, who are following along, this is session number two, and we're going to be speaking about Ihsan. Last week, and you can go back and watch this even through yahibrahim.com forward slash live, you can go and watch Soul Sessions 1, uh, Soul Searching Part 1. And you can get a little bit of the theological and um, philosophical understandings that we spoke about. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent us Islam, Iman, and Ihsan. Islam is the outward practice. Iman is the intellectual, rational practice. And Ihsan is the soul's tarbiyah. It's the soul's education, the soul's nurturing that Three being put together complement our mind, body, and soul. And therefore, Allah sent that perfect symmetry between Islam, Iman, Ihsan, and our body, mind, and soul. Because each of them needs different things and different acts of worship. So when you look at the act of worship that you and I perform as Muslims, physically, you will notice that they are aligned with what is referred to as Al-Islam physical manifestations of our inward being and state and acceptance. When you hear the definition of Iman, it's always something that is about the unseen where you have to subdue your thought and your mind to come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and approach. Those who believe in God and His angels and the scriptures and the messengers. All of those are things that are intellectual pursuits of faith. Ihsan is that Allah is a part and parcel of your life in a material conceptualization of yourself that it is you can see Allah in the work of everything that happens in your life. In the beauty of your young child, Allah is the one who gives life and takes life. In the healing and the death, in the illness and the and the wealth and prosperity or its poverty, all of it are things that you see and witness Allah. 
And the Prophet ﷺ, when he was asked, what is Ihsan? He said, أَن تَعْبُدَ اللَّهَ كَأَنَّكَ تَرَاهُ That you are worshipping and committed to your relationship with God as if you perceive Him, see Him in front of you. وَإِن لَمْ تَرَاهُ فَإِنَّهُ يَرَاكُ Although you cannot see Him in this worldly life, you recognize that He can see you wherever you may be. وَهَذَا رَأْسُ الْحِكْمَةِ وَأَسَاسُ التَّقْوَى that is the mastery of all wisdom, and it is the very basis of piety of the heart. That you recognize Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I am with you wherever you are. I see and I observe you wherever you may be, subhanahu wa ta'ala. That becomes a really ingrained process in my heart and your heart and that becomes the foundations of faith the word ihsan of course on its own it's often paired with concepts that relate to righteous deeds and and piety so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says inna allah yuhibbul muhsinin allah loves those who are practicers practitioners of ihsan which means doers of good deeds now, I want you to conceptualize that ihsan is not just simply an emotion. And iman and taqwa, faith and piety, consciousness, fear of God, they are never in the Islamic uh, uh, cosmology of how we believe and look out into the world that these are things that are just inward practices. No, rather very much they are meant to be things that show in the outward practice. And therefore, the very conceptualization of saying I'm a Muslim is not to say I pray five times a day and uh, you know I give zakah and I fast the month of Ramadan. No, those are the things that I do as obligations in Islam. But what makes you a Muslim is that those things of prayer, fasting, um, and, and zakah influence your character, that the tawheed you've submitted to, the worship of Allah alone, changes your very fibers, your very spiritual DNA to something that makes you view the world and be a part of the world in a different way, in a more positive way than had you not been acquainted and become known to Allah Azza wa Jal in that sense and been knowing of Allah Azza wa Jal. So it becomes really important for you to own that relationship with Allah, that Ihsan becomes an action. It is something that is not passive, but rather it is active. So when Allah speaks about the practice of Ihsan, He's speaking about Al Amal al Salih, the righteous deeds we perform. Inna Allah ma'alladina taqaw walladina hum muhsinun. Allah is with those who have an inner awakening, an inner consciousness, and an awareness of Him, and those who do muhsinun, muhsinin, those who practice Ihsan and fulfill their duties and obligations towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. لِلَّذِينَ أَحْسَنُ الْحُسْنَى Those who practice ihsan will have a greater return on that investment and that effort of practice. And therefore, those who have done good deeds will have a better reward than that, what they gave forward, that which they shared with others, that which they gave unto others. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he says it's that you worship Allah as if you see him, he doesn't say it's that you feel Allah sees you everywhere. And ta'bud Allah. Therefore, ihsan is linked to something being done, something being believed in, something being said, and something being acted on. And ta'bud Allah ka'annaka tara. That when you continue in the worship of Allah, which is the very essence of all process, both the ritual worship and the normal day-to-day -day life. So, al-amalu ibadah, one of the statements of the Prophet ﷺ is that going and, and practicing work or being engaged in a job that you perform is an act of obedience to God. It's an act of worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're seeking that which is halal, pushing yourself away from that which is haram, and that you've turned seeking the rizq, وَابْتَغُوا min فَضْلِ اللَّهِ Seeking the blessings that Allah has destined for us in this beautiful world, that becomes an act of worship. Worship is not just the prayer, the fasting, the rituals of worship, 
but rather worship is defined. And if you can make note of this, one of the uh, the easiest definitions, al-ibadah, اسم جامع لكل ما يحبه الله من قول أو من تصديق بقلب أو قول أو عمل. Uh, you know, عبادة is that it is the totality of your experience with Allah. Whether it's something you hold true in your heart or a statement of remembrance or worship or recitation of scripture that you recite. Or third, it is something that you act upon, you know, a generosity that you perform, an act of worship of ibadah that you do, or going out in a physical sense in the assistance of others to visit the sick or whatever it may be. All of those are seen as acts of worship. One isn't necessarily preferred to the other unless there is a decree from Allah that this is the ibadah of the time. But all of them have a place before Allah. So the worship of Allah, as if we see him, that Allah is witness to what we do, where we have iman bihi and ihtisab alayhi, that we have iman in Allah. This is why I'm doing it. I'm praying because I believe in God. But I also have ihtisab. I'm holding Allah that there is an account that I have with him, a balance that is set where I will reap a reward. There is something that will increase me. <clears throat> now, of course, there are minimum levels to Ihsan, and the most basic level of Ihsan is Al Islam, is to enter into faith, that you become a believer and that you accept that there are good deeds and that you accept that there are sinful deeds that you need to abstain from and to try to be distant from. And Al Ihsan is something that it is a variety of stations that you arrive at. And it is something that elevates as you become closer to Allah, that you grow in your experience and in your spiritual state. You arrive from station to station or from point to point or from level to level. And that's how the ulama would speak about al-ihsan and those who are muhsineen, that there is a cascading order of elevation. So the obligatory level of Ihsan, and you can follow along with, with the notes that I've set for you, is that a person does the deeds that are sincere towards Allah and that are commanded by Allah through the teaching of the Prophet ﷺ. The obligatory level of Ihsan is that whenever you worship Allah, you've done it with ikhlas, with sincerity. And the word ikhlas is a, a powerful word in the Arabic language. You might have an Arabic friend who just, you know, lost it. You know, he's just upset. He said, khalas, I've had enough. You know, khalas. And that's the very concept of ikhlas. You've had enough of putting your trust in anything other than Allah, of relying on anything, anyone other than Allah, on, on you know, on seeking anything from other than Allah. Al-isti'ana billahi wahda. You only ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's the only one you ask. And any other asking of other than Allah is haram. And it can lead to shirk. It can lead to disbelief in God if you actually believe that entity, that thing, that saint, that tomb, that cross, that you know individual, that prophet is the one that can help you rather than Allah. It then leads you into the worship of other than God. But in essence... Al-isti'ana, it is something that is a part as the very essence of your ihsan, that you've turned in totality your commitment to Allah. Iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'een. Only you do we provide the service and worship and adoration and love and fear and hope towards, and only you do we commit in seeking our needs from you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. None other than you. So that becomes an intent. And that a niyyah is very much the first stage of al-ihsan. What do you intend? Why do you do what you do? Now, I wanted to speak a little bit about the concept of niyyah that we have as Muslims. Niyyah is loosely translated in the English language as intention. But that word is such a poor word to describe niyyah. Niyyah is much more than just, oh, you know, I intend or I'm thinking of doing something. Intention in the English language, you know, say, I think I'm going to do this, or, you know, I may not do it. But niya is a commitment. It is a voluntary, conscious choice of commitment to a fact, to an act, to a statement, 
to a belief. So it's voluntary. It's not coercion. It is very much thought out, intentional in its, in its capacity. It's not haphazard. It's ju not just you fell into salah, you fell into a dua. No, it is, it is intentional in my, in, in my seeking to, to make this invocation or this prayer that there is an element of conscious awareness as I make that choice to move forward with it. And the third element of niyyah is that it is rewarded by Allah even if the action is not fulfilled. And that's powerful. So even if you do not carry through with the act of uh, that you were intending, if your niyyah was pure, then you get a reward for the mere intent that you had in your heart. And that becomes a very powerful thing that's found only in our faith that as Muslims, we believe the, the intent, the active process of, in, of, of voluntarily choosing to commit to something becomes in itself a practice of the thing, even though it hasn't come into reality yet. And the Prophet ﷺ says, The actions are predicated on that which preceded them in a conscious, voluntary, if, if intentional state of mind, heart, and support, you know, in, 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 in what I'm about to do. So the second level of ihsan, for any act of ihsan, for any act of good deeds that one is going to perform, the first is you've set yourself consciously, voluntarily, knowingly choosing to commit to this, to this act, to this statement, to this behavior, to this belief. Second, is that what you're committing to has a precedent and that you were led down the Surat al-Mustaqeem by the Sayyid of the Anbiya, the master of all prophets, the master of humanity. Look at the construct of Islam where Allah says to us, you know, to make dua, ihdina sirat al-mustaqim, lead us to the straight path. Whose path is it? Sirat al-ladhina an'amta alayhim, the path of those who you favored before us. Because the path has always been one. The way has always been one. The teaching has always been one. An i'budullaha ma lakum bihi ma lakum min ilahin ghayru. You have the one true God that you worship, and there is none that you are to turn to seeking devotion or worship of except him. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. So therefore the compliance of the modality of life, that you put your footstep in the footstep of the Prophet, that you walk where he walked, you, you start where he started, you stop where he stopped, you are limited by what he limited, and you have expanse and openness where he made expanse and openness. That your very dreams, hopes, and, and, and very essence of your worship seeks to mimic what he wanted. And therefore you find this beautiful hadith where a man comes and says, O oh Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I'm unable to worship Allah, to ask Allah in the way that you, and some, I, you know, I don't know how to be eloquent. I don't know how to make these requests. I don't know how to ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala the way you do. Can you teach me how to pray to Allah so that I get what you're asking for and that, you know, the things that you want is the same thing that I want. I want what you want. So the Prophet ﷺ says, and part of this dua, he says, Say, Allahumma inni as'aluka min khayr ma sa'alaka bihi abduka wa rasuluka wa nabiyuka Muhammad. Oh Allah, I ask you for everything good that the Prophet, your Nabi, your Rasul, you sent us to him, that he asked you of that good. Whatever the Prophet wanted, oh Allah, give me the same. Wa'a'udhu bika. I ask you to protect me from, to keep me away from, to stop me from. Min kulli minhu nabiyuka wa rasuluka Muhammad. From everything your Prophet asked to be protected from and to stay away from. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from any vulgarity of sin and wavering away from his path. So the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, as a part and parcel of your intentional, conditioned, voluntary choice to do an act, both of them coming together leads you to the first step of ihsan. That is the obligatory ihsan, where I am fulfilling the deeds Allah has ordered of me and doing it in the way the Prophet did it and with the intent of worshipping Allah, pleasing Allah, 
and knowing that my reward is with him subhanahu wa ta'ala. Of course, there are recommended levels. Now, as you begin your relationship with Allah, you begin to become more uh, conscious of your dealings with Allah and Allah's sight of you. And this concept of al-muraqaba, where you have a self-vigilance, self-reproach, self-discernment, where you are self-analyzing your behavior, your state, your beliefs, you're, you're acting upon them, that becomes something that leads you to growing in your faith, growing in your iman, growing in your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this muraqaba, therefore, is an essential element where you are seeing yourself the way Allah, you hope, is seeing you doing good and you are trying to eliminate that Allah will see or hear of you doing something that is prohibited. Muraqaba is very much a part of that statement of the Prophet ﷺ, and ta'bud Allah ka'annaka tarada. When you worship Allah, is it as if you witness Him? So you are witnessing yourself, and that Allah is very much a part of the life that you and I in, in His observing of us, hearing us, knowledge of us, knowing what our conditions are, and that we seek from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala purity and clarity, that the perception that we have for, of ourselves is not one that is clouded and distant from that which Allah seeks of us. The highest level of ihsan is that you enter into a place which the ulama refer to as al-mushahada, that you not just see yourself in the way Allah will see of you, but you begin to witness Allah as a part of the reality of your existence. Not that you see Allah, but that you witness Allah in everything that occurs. So in the good you experience, you know that Allah is a part of the decision of why the good you have received. So you say, Ma sha Allah. This is by the will of Allah. And then when there is an inconvenience, a difficulty, that which you perceive to be something undesirable, you witness Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You recognize that he is a part of what is that has befallen you. That if the whole world came together to give you what Allah has forbidden, they can't. And if they came together to benefit you in a way that Allah has ordered, they can't. You would not be benefiting and you would not be harmed. So you see that Allah is ar-Rahman. That in the pain that I'm in, Allah is still generous and merciful. That Allah is al-Razzaq. The moment I begin to drink and I say, Bismillah, that sip of water, Allah. Are you the one that brought this down? Or is it Allah that provided for you that you would not have been able to provide for yourself? When you are with somebody and you see somebody Commit an act of aggression, an act of sin, an act of, uh, you know, uh, you know, ma'asiyah. Uh, you say, A'udhu billahi min dhalik. I ask Allah to protect me from such. It's as if you are saying, oh Allah, you see what I'm saying. You are, you know what is happening now. Oh Allah, protect me from this. Don't let me fall prey and head towards those who fall into these problems and into these mistakes. May Allah protect us, Ya Rabb. And when you hear someone's been blessed, you recognize that it is from the order of Allah and that Allah is yuhi wa yumit. Allah gives life and takes life. Allah yazid, you know, increases. Wa yazidullahu liman yasha. Right? Allah increases whom he wishes. So you understand that the word Allah being al-hayy, al-qayyum, the ever-living, the all subsisting, the all sustaining is a reality. Is a reality that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lam yatrukna sudan wa hamala has not left us in an idle play that we just determine everything and that he is not present in our existence and in our life. You recognize that Allah very much is knowing of who we are. Yara makanana wa yasma'u kalamana. He sees our place and he hears our, our plea and our discussions. 
And Allah says to Musa alayhi salam, when Allah sees in the heart of Musa, فَأَوْجَسَ فِي نَفْسِهِ خِيفَةً Musa. Musa had a sense of fear in himself that he has to go and stand before Pharaoh. قُلْنَا لَا تَخَفْ I said, don't be afraid, ya Musa. إِنِّي مَعَكُمَا أَسْمَعُ وَأَرَى I am with you both. I see and I hear all. Allah says to the Prophet ثَانِيَ اثْنَيْنِ إِذْ هُمَا فِي الْغَارِ إِذْ يَقُولُ لِصَاحِبِهِ لَا تَخَفْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ مَعْنَا Allah is with us. This ma'iyya is not a physical presence, but one of power and authority and ability and seeing and hearing and knowledge and foreknowledge of what would occur before it takes origin and, and action. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala huwa al-ghaniyu dhu he is the one without need and the one who is giving of his mercy. Yanshuru rahmata. He is the one who spreads out his mercy over his creation, over all that he has put into existence, subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a basic initial understanding of the conceptualization and the things that relate to ihsan in understanding its place. So when we speak about ihsan, it's we're not speaking in the abstract, that we are speaking about just something that's an emotion or a philosophy or something in the heart, but it's in fact a demonstrable practice through our deeds and through our actions. May Allah make them actions that are fulfilling to the sunnah of our Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallim tasliman kathira. Now, I am conscious that there may be some questions that are being asked. For those of you who are on my Telegram service, please do send in your questions, inshallah. Very happy to receive them and be able to um, take them along uh, with you. Um, and those who are on uh, the Facebook, inshallah, I'll do my best to also answer some of the questions that may arise. But I am seeking, inshallah, the questions from the group first. All right, so some of the questions are beginning to roll in. How do we purify the intentions? So think of the key words that I said, that it is voluntary, which means that you understand that the act that you're performing is something that you have choice to have done it or not. And when you come to salah, you you know, you hear the mu'adhin, even if the adhan is on your phone, hayya ala salah, hayya al falah, come alive through this prayer, come to success through this prayer, there's many people who hear it but don't answer it. So this voluntary action of getting up becomes a part of the purification of intention. The amal is what shows the intention was true. And that's why you always want to follow through with your good deeds unless you are hindered by something that is uh, you know, put upon you. The essence of how you know your intention was righteous is that you did the action. Right? And that's something I always say to the people who join me for Hajj or for Umrah. A lot of the people, they come to Hajj. One of the first things that I set in their heart, I say, your Hajj is accepted. And they say, Sheikh, we didn't go to Harafa yet. We're still, we're still on the bus. We didn't, you know, we didn't get there yet. We didn't do anything yet. I say, subhanAllah, that Allah has brought you here, chosen you from His creation, and has set in your intent to spend this wealth, spend this energy, take the time from work, take the time from family, expend these kilometers, expend this uh, energy physically, it is a sign that you have come now and fulfilled this commitment that your intent was righteous and therefore your action is accepted by Allah. So the way to purify your intention is to recognize that your intention is voluntary and once the action is performed, you have shown your commitment and your action is accepted, inshallah. All right, we have another question. The ruh has been interpreted as Jibreel. Is this the case or does that mean the soul and the consciousness that we have? No, Jibreel, the word ar-ruh, signifies that he brings life into this dead world, meaning the spirit of faith. So he is a ruh al amin He conveys the spirit of faith. This world would be dead without iman. Allah gives that allegory, that imagery in the Quran. Give them the example of the one who is dead and then we brought them to life. 
meaning they were their heart had no iman and then iman entered sharah allahu sadrahu their chest was open to accept faith so iman entered the heart so that means that they have come to life the prophet sallallahu said the home where the quran is recited compared to a home where the quran is not recited is comparison to the living to the dead or the comparison of a home to a graveyard right Death for us is dual. There is the spiritual death and a physical death. So the Jibreel is the one who brings the ruh. Uh, when, uh, uh, when, 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 you know, the, the night moving and the light coming, that entrance into faith is the breath that is blown, the life that is given into the world when it was dark and dead before the message in the scripture of faith. The word ruh therefore signifies the spiritual state of faithfulness in Allah, but it is a description of the action of Jibreel in bringing down the scripture. All right. How much power does shaitan have to misguide us and how do we recognize the difference between his whispers and our own criticism? Uh, that's a very important theological question, right? The shaitan is weak. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَيْسَ لَكْ I don't give you power to overrun them. The shaitan does not think for you, cannot speak using your vocal cords, does not take over the body of a human being and makes them act in a way that they would not act themselves. None of those are orthodox beliefs that we have as Muslims. And therefore, much of what you see with the mental health issues that are displayed and sadly falsely. Uh, claim to be spiritual uh, possession, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from those who seek to prey on the, sim uh, you know, the simplicity of, of Muslims who are not learned in their aqidah. Uh, you know, a person cannot come to a qadi and say, I didn't divorce my wife, it was the jinn, he spoke through me. La, it's invalid, right? You could say you have a hundred jinn, makes no difference, it's still talaq, right? It, it's not excusing the fact. Why? Because there is no reality in that sense. What the shaitan does is yuwesswisu fi sudurin nas. In fact, Allah quotes the shaitan himself in Surah Ibrahim. So Allah tells us what the shaitan will say on the day of judgment. The shaitan will say on the day of judgment to the people who enter hellfire, who are blaming him. So the shaitan will say, الأمر, The shaitan will say, Your Lord promised you the true promise. Do good, you get good. Do bad, I will hold you accountable. And I promised you false promises. What are the promises of shaitan? He's not speaking to us. Is that he makes the world that we're in seem better than what it really is the thing that we desire as being better than what it actually is. So we are made to appear or to see or to feel that we want something greater than what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said. And therefore that becomes something where the shaitan, you weswis. The word weswesa in the Arabic language is weswesa, it's a sound, like it's like a a brooking, a bubbling brook. It's a sound in the Arabic language. So the weswesa is the clitic, clicking and clacking of gold. Weswesa al dhahab. You know, some of our sisters, they wear gold bangles and they, you know, let people know I've arrived. I've come in to the wedding. Clack, 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 clack. The sound of gold on gold is the sound of weswesa. So what the shaitan does, he amplifies our desires. Zuyina linnasi hubbu shahawati. Mankind have the desire for more. If you have a valley of gold, you want another valley. You say, let me see, let me go out exploring for more. So the shaitan amplifies what's already there. Illa and I only invited you. You came to what you wanted, and I just made it fair seeming. And Don't blame me. Walumu anfusakum. Right? Nobody on the day of judgment will be able to say, Ya Allah, shaitan made me do it. It's not my fault. It's, uh, you know, this is from the shaitan. Uh, and the answer to that is no. Um, 
So the shaitan has the capacity to place fear in us, anxiousness in us, make us worried about what other people will think about us. Get, you know, our self-conscious at times, let it go a little bit further than what it is. Make us feel uncomfortable with our deen and submission. Those kind of feelings of uneasiness. May Allah protect us, Ya Rabbi. How do we change from a, a change in our intention is that we renew it often. So always re-qualify your niyyah. And requalifying your niya is by asking Allah, Allahumma taqabbal minna. Oh Allah, accept this from us. Allahumma ja'alna min al-muttaqeen. Oh Allah, make us from the pious. Allahumma ja'alna mukhlisin laka ya arham rahim Oh Allah, make us from those who are, you know, sincere to you, ya Allah. Right? How do we stay content all times during ease and difficulty? That's not a reality. That's not possible. The Prophet ﷺ wept when he was in pain. He was happy when he was happy and he was sad when he was sad. Allah says to him, لَعَلَّكَ بَاخِعُ النَّفْسَكَ عَلَىٰ آثَارِهِمْ Ya Muhammad, you almost bring yourself to despair in your sorrow when you see them that they are unwilling to accept your faith, unwilling to accept Iman. Prophet would be devastated. We refer to the year of the death of Khadija radiallahu anha and his uncle um, and his grandfather uh, as uh, the Amul Huzn, the year of sorrow. The Prophet was sad for a year. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah quells his sadness. Ma rabbuka wa ma qala. Allah has never forsaken you, never left you. Uh, don't be in sorrow, right? Inna al kawthar. All these surahs are to cheer up the Prophet. Sallallahu alayhi so uh, I want you to understand from a psychological point of view. Um, to expect only good, only ease, only to be content is going to bring you to misery. You have to expect that there are good days and bad days. Allah says in the Quran, such are days we give them to mankind in turn. A day for you and a day against you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us Days that are for us and limit the days that are against us, and those where we are tested that we are not tested in our faith. Allahumma ameen. Allahumma la taj'al fitnatana fi deenina ya arhamar rahimeen. This is where I'll bring uh, the discussion to a conclusion, insha'Allah. I normally don't like to go past 30 minutes. We've gone about 30, 35 minutes, insha'Allah. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts from us. I hope to see you again next week, insha'Allah, every Wednesday at this same time where we will continue our series of soul searching. Bi'idhnillahi ta'ala. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah al-azimah li wa lakum fastaghfiruhu ya fawz al-mustaghfirin. Astaghfiru rabbakum innahu kana ghaffara. Wa salli allahumma wa sallim. Wa zid wa barik ala sayyidina wa habibina wa nabiyina Muhammad. Tibu al-qulubi wa dawa'iha. صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا سبحانك اللهم بحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته اللهم صل